Hey everyone, it's Wilmer from the Game Academy School. In this episode, let's automatically set up the player as a target for our chasers. The chasing behavior will remain the same, but it will no longer be broken if you decide to move the chasers into a separate subscene. And we'll accomplish this with what's called an entity query. This is a simple way to search for all entities associated with specific component data. In this case, we'll use it in a new system to set up our chasers at a specific point in the player loop. And it should be just a minor tweak to what we've done, so let's get to it. Let's begin with the starter project from the link in the description or just pick up where you left off. Go to the package manager and verify your packages. Here are the specific versions used in this video. Before we get too far into entity queries, as a small aside, we probably can refactor the face direction system from the last episode. Here's our face direction. Originally, I structured it like this to show you how you could apply tags to separate logic within the same system. But maybe I went a little bit too tag crazy in the process. And while I try to organize these videos around showing or reinforcing concepts that we've learned, probably we should simplify our logic by separating this part down here into its own system. Let's cut this block of logic. Just highlight this whole thing and then edit cut. And we'll make a new system called target to direction system. Let's create a new ECS system and call it target to direction system. Edit that. This is the old syntax, so let's inherit from system base instead. And we can gut all of this and add our usual on update method. Let's paste our logic into that and fix our formatting. And the only thing I'm going to remove is the call to face direction. We'll let the original face direction system handle that part. The rest of this, if you recall, converts a target entity into a move data direction. For a refresher, just check out the last video on component data from entity. You can keep the tags active here if you'd like, just in case you don't want this system to run accidentally on other entities. But if you removed it, it would work also since we don't have any other entities with these specific data types. Don't forget the input parameters themselves act like a filter. So let's save this and it should still be active for all the chasers. But we do have to go back to the original face direction system and remove the filter there. We really don't need this logic specific to a player or a chaser. Basically, the system will now run on all entities that have a rotation, translation, and move data. So it will turn that entity to face the proper direction if one is given. It doesn't matter if the entity is a chaser or if it's a player, the system just doesn't care and treats them all the same. It can process all the matching entities one time instead of doing two separate queries. And that feels a little bit simpler. It's a little bit more concise and probably that's a blip in the grand scheme of things, but it's good to do nonetheless. And if everything went well, then it should probably look exactly the same. Hooray. Okay, so thanks to you guys, especially Cyril for keeping me honest. If there's anything else like that, please leave me a comment below. Our chasers still work because we haven't moved them to a separate subscene. They're still in the player's spaceship subscene, and that allows us to assign the player as a target in the inspector. As we showed you in the last episode, if you move the chasers to a separate chaser subscene, then we're no longer allowed to associate the player in that empty field. That breaks the connection and hence breaks our behavior. Now making connections like this in classic Unity is pretty common. If you have a public or serialized field in the inspector, you can often populate it with another component or game object interactively just by dragging it into the field. But often you will need to fill it out at runtime instead. And in that case, you might need to use one of the various find operations available to Unity objects and mono behaviors. And then just store the results of those operations in their respective fields. Now what we want to do in dots is something similar, except instead of game objects, we want to find entities. And we'll do that with what's called an entity query. An entity query is a way for us to ask Unity what entities match certain components. You search by data type and then Unity returns all the entities that have this specific type of data. 
If that sounds familiar, it's because you've been using entity queries the whole time. The system base gives us this entities for each, and this structure runs an entity query internally using the filters and input parameters of its Lambda function. But the entity query is just not transparent to us. Now we can set up an entity query separately if you just want to do something with them, like get an array of entities or get an array of component data. So make a new ECS system, and we're going to call this assign player to target system. So if we have some target data, this system will assign the player to the target entity field. Let's set up the system per usual, system base, on update, you know the drill. Inside of the on update, just create an entity query. Entity query, player query equals get entity query. And then we pass in type of plus some data type inside of the parentheses. In this case, it's the player tag. You can further optimize by passing the data type as read only. Let me comment this out and write it out slightly differently. We can replace the type of with component type read only. Player tag goes into the angle brackets. Even though it's slightly longer, use read only whenever you can, since that will speed up your jobs. Once you have your entity query set up, you have several options to convert the data into something useful. Very often, you'll turn it into a native array, either of entities or of a specific component type. Do that with the two entity array or two component data array methods. In this example, you can create a query of all the entities with player tag and translation components. You then convert that to a native array of entities, like so. Or you could use the two component data array to convert this into a native array of translations. Just put the type T in the angle brackets. In our case, we want to locate the one entity with the player tag component. You can simply grab the first entity after converting it into a native array of entities. And we can just use allocator temp or allocator temp job. And that means we need to dispose of it as well. But instead, what we're going to do is just skip this step. And since we only want the one entity in our scene of type player tag, I can use the get singleton entity method. And probably you'll use this less commonly, but it makes sense in this specific example. Once we have the player entity, we can use the entities for each structure for every chaser in our scene that has a target data component. So let's just start our entities for each. We can filter by chaser tag. And let's flesh out our for each logic. You can schedule it on a worker thread. And let's set up the blank lambda. We require a target data as an input parameter. So I'll add a ref target data, target data. And inside of here, we can assign the player entity. We do need to check to make sure that the entity is valid. Now for entities, we can't simply check against null. We need to check against entity.null. Just note that minor distinction. So this now says that if we do have a valid entity, then assign it to the target entity field of the target data. OK, let's save the script. And the system should fill in the entity target for all the chasers on each frame. And yep. Our chasing behavior now works again. It doesn't matter if we fill out the target entity in the inspector anymore. The assign player to target system takes care of that. So no more dragging and dropping. OK, that works. But we should probably talk about callback order. Currently, we're setting up the target entity on every frame, even though we might only need to do so once. Though on update is required for system base, it's not the only place you can execute code. We also have callbacks called on create, on destroy, on start running, and on stop running. Any logic you put inside of these methods will run in a specific order. The lifecycle of a system looks like this, sort of like a simplified mono behavior. On create runs when the system first sets up. On start running invokes just once when the simulation begins. And then on update in here runs every frame. On stop running is invoked when you stop or disable the system, and then on destroy runs right before you remove or destroy it. If I took all of this logic and extracted it, I can make a small method called, let's say, assign player. Then we could remove it from the on update and instead use it in one of the other callbacks. 
I probably don't want to use the on create because some things might not be set up just yet, but I could use on start running and let's invoke assign player in on start running. Save the script and let's try it. And look at that. Everything still works. This time we're invoking the logic for assigning the player just once. Of course, you might need to assign the player stuff to run every frame if you are spawning, say, more chasers during gameplay, but we're not in this example, so it's safe just to run once in on start running. While we're on the subject of ordering things, we should also mention system update order. On a given frame, you can control which systems execute before others. Let's say you wanted the assign player to target system to run before the target to direction system. You can do that using system groups. To understand those, go to play mode and pause the editor, open the entity debugger, and take a look at the left hand panel. Make sure you have the default world selected from the drop down at the top. Each world contains a hierarchy of system groups. We have three of them at the root level, initialization system group, simulation system group, and presentation system group. By default, our systems belong to the middle one, the simulation system group. And you can see them here in the debugger in their current order, along with how long each takes to calculate on one frame. There's other stuff in here too that might not be familiar. There are other systems related to the entity command buffers, but ignore those for the moment. We'll discuss those in a later video. For now, just watch our systems and the system groups that will help us determine their order of execution. Currently, our target to direction system is running before the assign player to target system. We can fix that by editing both scripts. Dots gives us three attributes to help us tweak the execution order. Update before, update after, and update in group. Let's add this attribute to the top of the class definition. Update in group, type of, initialization, system group. This will move the system to that first group. To verify that, exit and save the script. Restart play mode and check the entity debugger again. And now you can see the system running up here in the initialization group. That happens before all the other systems, so the ordering is better, but we might not want it in there. You can see that a lot of scene conversion stuff is happening here. We may be in danger of running the logic before some of the scene setup is complete. To change the group back, we can make this simulation system group, which is the same as omitting this line altogether, since that's the default. Let's add another attribute update before type of target to direction system. This will make this system run explicitly before target to direction, save and restart playback. Now you can see both systems are in the same group, but we've changed their order. Now at this point, you might wanna go in and reorder some of your systems. You can use any of these systems or system groups at your disposal in this transform system group, for example, a lot of the basic entity transforms are taking place, you might want the face direction system to always happen after the entities in your scene have moved. In that case, you just edit the script in question, add an update after, type of, transform system group, and done. You're basically using the system groups as a reference point. Feel free to reorder them with the before and after attributes. Just a warning though, there are some common sense limitations on system update order. You'll have to avoid circular dependencies. Don't try to make script A run before script B and then try to make B run before A, that's a no-no. And you'll have to limit the scope of your update before and update after to the current group. If you're in the simulation system group, for example, you can't refer to things in the presentation group. Of course, the order really makes no difference for what we're doing here, since most of our systems run on every frame. At most, there would be a one frame lag, but sometimes that order can make a big difference, especially for systems that only fire off once. But in our case, it shouldn't have too much impact and everything looks about the same. And okay, there you go. We didn't add a whole lot of extra functionality here, but we did explore how you can do a little bit of setup automatically using entity queries and we learned how to control the flow of your logic using callback order within a system, and you learn how to order systems themselves using system groups.
Now that we know how to use entity queries and component data from entity, it's probably time to add some collisions, but that'll have to wait until next episode since we're out of time. Again, thanks for watching. Just a reminder, sign up for the mailing list if you are interested in the full dots course. Until then, check out our classic courses at Game Academy School. Links for all of those in the description. Okay, well, this is Wilmer. Until the next one, happy game dev and keep moving those entities.